Thank you, Flora, and thanks to the organizing com committee to, for the kind invitation. I um, must say that uh, uh, several parts of, of uh, this presentation have been already covered and will be covered later on. I apologize for this, but I remember that uh, ancient Romans used to say repetita juvent, so in some way I hope that uh, nevertheless it will be not so boring. So here are my disclosures. Well, you know, it is well known that uh, normal pregnancy is uh, associated with uh, biochemical modification characterized by increased clotting concentrations, that is an increase especially of fibrinogen, factor eight, and pompilomer factor. There is also an impairment of the naturally inhibitory system characterized by the reduction of free protein S. And also fibrinolysis is affected in some way because there is an increase of uh, inhibitor of plasminogen activator. This uh, overall leads to the so-called hypercoagulative state of pregnancy can contribute to the increased risk of venous thrombohemolysms occurring in pregnancy. But uh, nevertheless, we know that uh, bleeding may occur, parturition, and there is a self-reported by approximately 20% of women, and we know that most of the most important causes are anatomical ones, uh, including uterine atonia, placenta previa, or something like this. So how uh, inherited bleeding disorder can contribute to the risk of a bleeding at delivery? We know that during uh, the normal reproductive life, women are affected by some physiological, paraphysiological situations that uh, can cause uh, bleeding by itself, uh, also in uh, normal women, but of course in women with the inherited bleeding disorders, this risk uh, could be even higher. And so we have to discuss how to prevent and treat this situation, especially we are talking about uh, the pregnancy, during pregnancy at, at the, the delivery. So there is no doubt that for each clotting factor, uh, there is a, a specific uh, risk of increased bleeding at delivery for women affected by severe rare inherited clotting disorders. We have already seen that uh, carriers for hemophilia are not uh, spared by the risk of increased bleeding at parturition, even when the factor level is not so uh, reduced. And we know also that uh, there is an important disorder already presented, that is von Buren disease, that uh, must be taken into account because of its uh, peculiar relationship uh, with the factor A. So we have to discuss, and we will discuss, uh, I've seen uh, later on, some specific situation for von Buren disease. Uh, there are some rare but really clinically important situations characterized by uh, high risk of miscarriage. The risk of miscarriage for patients affected by severe factor 13 deficiency and high fi fibrinogenemia is very high. And we know that we must uh, start prophylaxis very early for these women because there is a high risk uh, of a early miscarriage of 50 to 60 to sixth week. Uh, and so we must uh, try to plan pregnancy with uh, every woman affected by severe factor 15 deficiency because uh, the risk of uh, early bleeding is very high. And we are very lucky because we just, we, we need to administer every three to four weeks uh, low dose of factor 15 concentrate to prevent bleeding and miscarriage. The same as to the high fibrinogenemia because also in this case there is uh, early vaginal bleeding and the high risk of miscarriage, so prophylaxis should be undertaken very early also in these uh, women and we should maintain a trough level around 100 milligram per deciliter. But uh, there is also some recent information uh, uh, that uh, are showing us that also milder abnormalities of fibrinogen molecule that is congenital this fibrinogenemia is uh, potentially affected by high risk of uh, bleeding and perturition. What is important to uh, underline is the fact that we don't need uh, the specific uh, mutation. We need to know exactly the bleeding phenotype to predict the risk of bleeding and perturition for women with the inherited uh, this fibrinogenemia. So this is an important information that for most, especially of mild bleeding disorders, the clinical history before uh, parturition is really important to provide a clue for the best treatment uh, during delivery. A tricky situation is uh, factor 11 deficiency. Here we have some data from the Israeli group uh, collecting, uh, you see, 
uh, 160 deliveries in, patient, in women with a severe FAT11 uh, deficiency, you see that uh, all these women underwent uh, uh, delivery without any anti-hemorrhagic prophylaxis. And you see that for 70% of these women, there was no bleeding complication, despite no specific treatment. And the 30% of women who bled as, were women with the already presenting with a clinical bleeding phenotype and also presenting with the same typical complication that is recurrent bleeding and perturbation in a previous uh, uh, situation, occasion. It's important to underline the fact that there is no relationship with the genotype and factor 11 level. And especially, we must be really cautious because the replacement therapy may be associated with increased risk of thrombosis when using FAT11 concentrates, or the in inhibitor homes, and especially in, in women characterized by the very frequent type 2 mutations. Antifibrinolytics in FAT11 deficiency are very useful and should be tried first uh, in less if the patient is not bleeding so much. Also for other rare uh, bleeding disorder, there is a, a clear demonstration that uh, replacement therapy with the uh, uh, solvent detergent plasma are useful. Here you see some examples with the factor five and factor five and factor eight deficiency. And uh, as to the carrier hemophilia, we have already uh, listened to the presentation of the UK guidelines. You see that uh, the main problem is uh, uh, especially for those women with extreme ionization, with, so with the severe um, deficiency or factor A or factor 9. During pregnancy, there is, a, for most of these carriers, a complete normalization of the levels uh, by the time of parturition, while for women with the uh, carriership for hemophilia B, you see that there is minor or no modification. So these women, if they are starting pregnancy with a, a, a significant reduction of fat to nine, we should plan the best treatment uh, during, during delivery. Treatment is required for those, uh, I would agree that uh, 15 units per deciliter is a good level. Here we have some uh, historical example that uh, uh, also for patients uh, uh, of course, uh, not requiring epidural anesthesia. Maybe levels uh, between 30 to 50 are not so uh, bad for uh, um, vaginal delivery, while for a surgical, that is a cesarean section, is better to increase, of course, the level at the time of uh, uh, surgery. Uh, treatment should cover at least initial three days or five days when the cesarean section is performed. Again, five antifibrinolytics are very useful also in this setting. Here we have some example <clears throat> of the useful um, uh, benefit of desmopressin in carriers uh, of hemophilia A, also for patients with von Willebrand disease during early pregnancy. You see that the drug is able to increase efficiently uh, the levels of factor A and von Willebrand factor. There is no side effect and no bleeding complication, no miscarriages. So the drug can be used at least uh, during the first trimester really confidently. What about the risk of uterine bleeding during pregnancy? You see that uh, in a uh, past study, there was a clear demonstration that uh, women affected by severe rare bleeding disorders are also uh, characterized by an increased risk of uh, uterine bleeding during uh, pregnancy. You see that uh, this is not the case uh, usually for hemophilia carers and patients with von Willebrand disease uh, bleed uh, very rarely during uh, pregnancy. And this is because uh, we have already seen that uh, during uh, pregnancy there is a huge increase of uh, factor A and von Willebrand factor in uh, normal women, but this is also the case uh, for most of the patients affected by type 1 von Willebrand disease. The risk of miscarriage and bleeding during pregnancy is mobile disease has uh, provided some inconsistent results in the past because you see that uh, according to a case control study, there is a, a small increase of this risk. A retrospective study in DDAVP unresponsive, that is uh, women characterized by severe phenotype, usually there is an increased uh, uh, risk of miscarriage, 22%. 
but a large study uh, coordinated by um, Flora Peivandi demonstrated that it was similar to normals uh, in a large population of Iranian women affected by type 3 von Willemann disease. A large case control study of uh, 4,000 deliveries in women with von Willemann disease not well characterized, we are not aware about uh, uh, what percentage of patients were affected by type 1, type 2, or type 3 showed that there was a, a tenfold higher risk of uh, antepartum bleeding, but there was not increased risk of a placental abruption, preterm delivery, fetal growth restriction, or still build. So, especially for women with a mild bombinum fatal deficiency, the risk of uterine bleeding seems to be not so significant. And here, again, a study of uh, uh, Flora Peivandi's group showed that uh, the risk of bleeding during pregnancy in inherited coagulation disorders was significantly higher in women affected by rare bleeding disorders, but you can see that women affected by bombillion disease show the same risk as to the uh, normal control group. So going to the risk of bleeding and delivering bombillion disease, again, we have some case control study, but I must say that for most of the studies, we are not a good characterization of the patient population. So we must try to uh, have to get some uh, information, especially from the, the data presented to uh, assume whether these women are mainly affected by type one or mild reduction of bilirubin factor that is not true on bilirubin disease. You can see that uh, again, the risk of bleeding and delivery in the study by James is uh, around uh, 1.5 for bleeding and is uh, even increased uh, uh, up to fivefold uh, of uh, the likelihood to be transfused. Uh, but uh, uh, most importantly, there is also an increased risk of perineal hematoma, and we should always consider this risk when deciding treatment for a woman with von Willemann disease. If you look at the possibility to score the severity of bleeding, uh, postpartum bleeding, in women with von Willemann disease, we got some data in the past, especially, and this is important, before the diagnosis, because most of the studies are uh, especially investigating patients already diagnosed. So in some way, there is a modification of the bleeding phenotype carried out by the fact that the women has been, have been already diagnosed. But if you consider women before diagnosis, and especially women, you see with type one, but with a significant reduction of bombinomer factor, you see that the risk is uh, up to eightfold greater of having uh, bleeding, parturition, or being treated for uh, severity of bleeding with uh, blood transfusion, dilatation, carotage, or suturing. So we must be take attention, especially for women with a significant reduction of bombinomer factor, because we know that when we mix all the patients with type one, and we see uh, what about the risk of uh, postpartum bleeding in uh, this patient population. You see that uh, in the European study we published uh, some years ago, when putting together all the women with a different severity of reduction of bovinal factor associated with type one, you see that uh, the risk is not increased. It's the same as the normal population, because of course, there are several women that uh, have a, a, a full correction of factor A and von Willemann factor by the end of delivery. And uh, because we know that uh, even patients with uh, levels, basal level around 30%, may have a full correction of, uh, uh, or at least levels greater than 50 units per deciliter by the end of pregnancy. And uh, if we look also at the different mutations, at the different type of response to the DVP, we can have also additional information. What about uh, the likelihood to have uh, an increase of viral factor and factor A, or the pattern of changes across pregnancy for all these women? You see that women affected by uh, the Vicenza mutation and another very frequent mutation associated with an increased clearance you see that during pregnancy, although there is a, a huge increase of the mohitis after DDAVP, but during pregnancy, there is no uh, really significant increase of factor A and bombinomer factor. While for other type one mutation, you see that there is an increase and a correction 
of factor A n von Willebrand factor. And you see that also for patients with type 2n, homozygous mutation associated with type 2n, you have a, a correction of factor A and von Willebrand factor by the end of pregnancy. And interestingly, other mutation you see that may have a very different behavior during pregnancy. You can have uh, some patients with type 2a. You see there is a huge increase of uh, factor A and von Willebrand factor, but histocytical factor is not modified by the end of pregnancy. And you see the other recessive uh, patients uh, may have a, an increase of factor A during pregnancy, but no modification of von Willebrand factor. So I agree that before pregnancy, we should have uh, the data also of DDAVP response to try to anticipate uh, the need for a treatment, for appropriate treatment for the woman by the time of parturition. So for women with von Willebrand disease, uterine bleeding risk is especially limited to severe cases. Laboratory monitoring during pregnancy is always advised, at least one, two months before a delivery. We, we know that factor A von Willebrand factor usually normalized in type one where there is a, the same degree of deficiency of factor A and von Willebrand factor, and by the end of pregnancy, we will have uh, levels usually greater than 50 units per deciliter, and these levels are usually safe to avoid uh, anti-hemorrhagic prophylaxis, including epidural anesthesia, although I would uh, agree that uh, an uh, anesthesiologist would have uh, really levels uh, uh, approaching 100 units per deciliter to be really safe uh, to, to cover epidural anesthesia. There are some mutations uh, associated with increased clearance uh, for whom uh, um, there is no significant increase of uh, factor A hemon villanor factor during pregnancy, and this is also the case for type 3 and some type 2, two uh, patients. For those who are responsive, any Anyhow, we can use desmopressin because also for patients showing uh, no increase of von Willebrand factor, that is patients with increased von Willebrand factor clearance, uh, we can use confidently uh, desmopressin uh, repeatedly because it's able to prevent the bleeding to cover uh, the risk of bleeding in these women. Replacement therapy is, of course, for unresponsive patients and usually the dose, uh, the starting dose is uh, around 50 units of factor eight uh, at delivery followed by uh, additional infusion uh, during the, the following days. And also for these women, of course, laboratory monitoring is advisable. Finally, we have seen that it's important also to try to avoid traumatic devices uh, to part for the risk of hematoma in the newborn. Cesarean section is only for obstetric uh, indication. There is no need uh, to start with the cesarean uh, section because the patient is affected by von Willebrand disease. And the blood sampling for the neonate is usually not required unless a potential type 3 offspring uh, is expected. So only for this kind of uh, population we suggest to have uh, uh, blood sampling also from the newborn. What about the type 2B? Really a tricky situation. I don't want to go through too much because uh, Dr. Biguzzi will discuss later this peculiar subtype. I, I must only underline the fact that there is really a tricky situation because there is also a, a, a decrease of platelet -like count uh, uh, by the end of pregnancy, so we have to manage uh, confidently also this uh, hemostatic additional defect. And what about the risk of delay postpartum bleeding? There are uh, uh, an average risk, average risk of a 20, up to 25%, uh, and the risk may last uh, up to two to three weeks uh, following delivery. Bombinar factor usually returns to baseline within seven to 10 days. Prolonged treatment uh, is uh, advisable for type two and type three uh, at delivery, and uh, we know, as already discussed, that oral antifibrinolytics uh, are useful uh, for treating and especially for prevention of a bleeding um, um, during the postpartum period. And you see that a previous study already demonstrated that uh, patients treated prophylactically, prophylactically compared to patients not treated for uh, bleeding, possibility of bleeding uh, at parturition, you see that prophylaxis is usually able to significantly reduce uh, 
the risk of bleeding. Sometimes it is not able to abolish completely for other reasons, comprising also the fact that uh, sometimes prophylaxis is not so accurately performed in such patient population. So to conclude, in women with severe rare bleeding disorder, pregnancy should always uh, uh, be planned because there is a high risk of miscarriage and a high risk of uterine bleeding. We have to prepare the woman to this uh, uh, risk also during pregnancy. These patients should be uh, carefully monitored during pregnancy and uh, as to the von Willebrand disease patients, we know that uh, this population is uh, very heterogeneous. Uh, we must uh, check accurate, accurately the levels we are getting uh, every uh, woman uh, one to two months before delivery. And uh, for delivery, a multidisciplinary approach is always advisable and appropriate management must be supervised by the, an expert in coagulation disorders. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>